that is every motorcyclist's worst nightmare. When your 200, your 400, or even your 1,000 pound crash helmet falls on the floor, gets kicked or whatever. We, there's conflicting information here. Some manufacturers will say, if you drop it, it's a write-off. Others will say, you can drop it. As long as your head's not in it, it won't be damaged. How do you know? How do you know your safety isn't being compromised if you do do that and you drop your helmet? Well, there is a solution. Today, I'm at the helmet inspection company who actually can structurally test your helmet using lasers to tell you whether it's still fit for purpose. And if you do crash, whether that drop is actually going to structurally put your life in danger, basically. So let's take a little bit of a closer look and head inside. So we have with us Martin, or you have me with you because we were, we're at the helmet inspection company. So Martin, you started this up. We we're gonna have a chat with John, who's the professor behind all the technical stuff. I've had a little chat with him. He's blowing my mind already. So we'll get on and talk about the technical of how we test helmets, etc. But you're a biker. Yeah. Why did you start this up? What, 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 what was the reason behind it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I uh, bought a new NXR, a showy NXR a um, couple of years ago and um, I was out on the bike in the summer, um, spotted a whole group of bikers, so I thought yeah. a cafe, so I thought I'd just stop off and have a chat with the guys, you know, and uh, because there was a lot of bikes there, I didn't have much room to, yeah. to put my bike in, so I did the one thing that I never do, and I put my helmet on the indicator stock. And that stupidity was paid back straight away because I... <laughs> We've all done it. Yeah, we have. And uh, as I was squeezing between the bikes, I just heard the dull thump uh, behind me as I just knocked this off, off the, uh, the indicator stock. I took it down to the bike shop, my local bike shop, um, where they've got a showy uh, dealership there as well. They had a tech have a look at it. Um, she took out the inner skull, the, the skull liner, um, give it a visual inspection, uh, had a, give it a visual inspection on the outside as well, and then just declared that it should be okay. Mm. So <laughs> should should be okay. <laughs> so there's just uh, that just wasn't enough for me, yeah, John. I yeah. I, uh, I was really um, I just wasn't. I didn't fill me with with. It didn't inspire me with the confidence. Nevertheless, I went out on the bike. Uh, a couple of times after that, every single time I was out yeah. on the bike, I was I just had this nagging feeling. If something happens here, is this helmet really going to work? Is yeah. it really going to do its job? Let's have a chat with John. Let's talk about the sort of technology behind testing helmets internally to see, you know, like you said, you know, you've dropped it visibly. You may have a tiny little mark on the front, but yeah, it looks okay. But how is the actual structure inside that you can't see? Yeah. Let's have a chat with John. I'm going to come in and interrupt the video at times because John is an amazing guy, you know, but it, it, I, I want to keep this video quite snappy. I don't want it to just go on and on about all the technical stuff. So I'm going to interrupt and sort of uh, give you the layman's version, if you like, of what happened. Otherwise, this video will be about an hour and 10 minutes long and uh, you'll switch off by then. So I'll be popping in to give you some information and to abbreviate. So this is Professor John Tyra. He's the brains behind the outfit. No, no offence, Martin. John, if you could just take us a little bit through the technology because it's all lasers and I know a little, little bit about your background as well. As to, right. As to, as to so what, I, what I use lasers to make things. I either use lasers, high power lasers to cut and machine out or I use lasers for measuring things. Okay. And when it comes to measuring things, one of the key things in, in any form of manufacturing is to understand why something breaks or is it fit for purpose. So we can measure it to make sure it does what it's supposed to do, and we can you know, use that to confirm computer designs, etc. But we can also use lasers to measure whether or not the thing that we've made is doing actually what we want it to do. Right. Now this is the topic of non-destructive testing. So we want to be able to test a product without hurting it, and then being able to say, this is fit for purpose, it can go for sale or it can go back to be worn or it can go back in the air or, yeah. or whatever. So what you see here, a sort of souped up TV holography system. So we have a, a camera system here with some optics that does all the clever work. We have a laser beam coming out of this box here. And you'll notice that we're producing onto the helmet here, this green pattern. Yeah. And that pattern is playing with your eyes. I was going to say it's messing with your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and that pattern is called the speckle pattern. Okay. 
And what it allows us to do is if the uh, laser isn't moving, if the object isn't moving, and if the measuring instrument, the interferometer, isn't moving, then nothing changes. And in fact, what we can see on this monitor here yeah. is the pattern is very stationary. I've just fiddled with it, so it's, it's been moving. But now it's relatively stationary, whereas when you're looking at it with your eye, yeah. it's moving. And that's because the speckle pattern isn't on the surface. It's actually made in your eye, and it's made in this camera. Really? And the reason the pattern's moving is because your head's moving. Now, your film camera over there won't be seeing all of right, that movement I because that's that, yeah. it, right? It is happening, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we have here is this instrument, and what it does is instead of just a simple camera, if I put this cross in the way, you can see that it's in one axis it's fine, but this vertical is split into two. Yeah. And this is an instrument known as a shearing interferometer. That's the posh words, that's how we make it work as a laser measuring machine. Right. Right? And it's that that if you're into measuring strain, that's how much, that, that's what we call the gauge length. That's how we measure the strain. So we can adjust the sensitivity meant to make it more or less sensitive. Now this composite helmet here has had a, a bit of a rough time. And what I want to do now is I want to see whether or not there's any damage. Yeah. One of the ways of doing that is if I heat it up gently, it will expand. And in expanding, because of the heat, that generates movement. And if the object is all nice and uniform, it will move nice and uniformly. Right. If it can't expand uniformly because of some damage underneath it, then the damage will have, the, the load, that thermal strain, will have to go around it. So did you get that? So basically what John's doing is heating an object to see it expand, and if an area has damage, it doesn't expand in a uniform fashion, and his equipment detects where uh, the material's not expanding in a uniform fashion, and that's how he's indicating where the damage is. I think that's it. Yeah. So you as an advanced user, now you've had the training course, tell me where the damage is. <laughs> uh, the, the dark areas are damage. Yeah, in fact that whole area is pretty messed up. And in fact what I can now do is I can unwrap that so that we can now look at it in terms of strain. So what that's telling me is mechanically that object over here, that's a nice uniform grey. Yeah. That's nice uniform strain, it's nicely expanding. But in this region here, we've got a lot of damage. Really? Okay. And it's as simple as that. So I know what some of you may be saying, you know, this is snake oil, this is baffling with bullshit, you know. Now, I've been caught out with that before on this channel, bullshit bafflers, and this is not bullshit. John is a professor at Loughborough University. John Terrell, Google him if you don't believe me, he's got patents to his name, he's got a list of PhDs, he's got, you know, this guy has been, he designed this technology, he's been using it with the INLI for 30 years or 25 years to test their holes to look for damage, you know, this is not bullshit. <laughs> it sounds bullshit because it just sounds like you're being baffled with information, but John is a very clever guy. He's worked, he, 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 throughout the day, I basically had a free lecture and we went, we covered all sorts of, all sorts of things. He does, he uses this measuring technology on bodies. He measures eyes, you know, he, he measures like hip joints. People contact him and say, why are hip joints only lasting 10 years? And he analyzes the stress of bone movements, muscles. He's even patented his own bra system for women. So uh, he showed me all of his videos of, of breasts and measuring how they move and then designing a support system, which Marks and Spencers are now selling. So honestly, this guy is incredible. The interesting thing is, if I now pick up the helmet, and now say, you find the damage. Yeah. Now what happens with this type of impact is when the helmet is dropped, for example, the top shell, as it hits, it just compresses and flexes ever so gently. Yeah. Nothing happens. So from the surface, the gel coat yeah. and everything is fine. Yeah. So you think, oh, 
However, because of the thickness of this, uh, the, the skin of the helmet, on the other side, it goes beyond the, the strength of the binding between the fibres and the, the glue that's holding it all together, the matrix. And you then get all sorts of damage. And that's what actually we can see. Yeah. So even, it's, it's even just a though, tiny little bit of speckled, isn't it? Right. So even, okay. even though you might think, oh, well, the impact was only that big. Yeah. What this teaches us is we can see how large the damage area is. And as you can see, it's, it's a very large yeah, part yeah, of that. Sort of all, all of that there, that whole area, really. Right. It? So yeah. this not only gives us the ability to see... When, whether or not something is damaged, but we can see how big the consequence of that damage is over the whole structure. So, so to summarise, make sure I've got all that. So basically you're using, you're using temperature to expand the material to see where damage is, tensile strength as it expands ever so slightly, and yes. you can see where the way the expansion's working is to around the damaged area. Exactly. Oh wow, that, that's fascinating. I should also just make you aware the equipment John was using there wasn't their primary equipment they use when doing testing normally. They actually had a job with one of the lifeboats they had to take the proper equipment away for. So that was some equipment he picked up from the university to show how it worked. So that wasn't the normal test station, test bed, test equipment there. That was something he rigged up just to show me how the technology works. So this obviously isn't your day job. You said you've got 30 plus years experience of testing composite materials. Right. What, what other stuff are you doing here then? Well, in terms of composite testing, we test everything from the, all the lifeboats for the RNLI, and we've tested those for 25 years. So we make sure that every vessel in the fleet of the RNLI is tested when it's new, when it comes out the moulds, so we check it all. Yeah. And then every time they get into trouble, if they get uh, hit or whatever, in a, or when they come back for refit, we go back down and resurvey, and we can see any damage, and then we can report right. where that damage is, and then that gets repaired, and then we can check it and say, yes, this is good to go. Right. So that's an example of using this sort of technology for composites, and, and trust me, all the lifeboats are carbon fibre yeah. and have been oh, for a very long so, oh, yeah. so you, But it's, it's the same thing, fiberglass, carbon fibre. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's all, yeah. it's, it, they have different properties, but um, aircraft, um, spacecraft, submarines, you name it. We, cars, etc. And it's not just looking for defects, but also for validating the design models so that we can actually see how they work. So as, if a designer says, well, I've got this new concept for a, for a new hull, for example, whether it be a hull of an aircraft or a hull of a, a boat, and it, we think it's going to work like this, but weight is critical. We want to make sure that we've got the highest performing structure. Yeah. We can then validate that the strain and the load, the way the designer thinks as it's working and it should be doing what it's doing, we can simulate those loads and then we can actually see the loads flowing through the structure. So can you, as part of this process, say for instance, you bought a carbon fiber wheel, a new one. Could you, with this, can you check how, whether it was manufactured correctly? Exactly. So you could even go down, not damage, but just the you know, and in laid fact, of carbon in the right direction. And that is what we do for a number of very expensive automotive applications. Oh, okay. Because nobody, nobody sets out to make a bad helmet. No. Nobody sets out to make a bad, bad wheel. But if you don't have this knowledge, if you don't have the feedback that says, oh, if you don't finish it off right here, look, you've left this problem, it will lead to a fatigue issue. Yeah. So where they think from a design point of view, where they put the material properties in and say, well, that's, that, that's a good wheel, when they actually come to making it and they're actually laying it up by hand, if they don't understand the, the criticality of how you lay things up, then we can have problems. And nobody notices, because it's nice and shiny. We all like shiny black carbon fiber. Yeah. And uh, I'm afraid of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> buried beneath it yeah, a... are all sorts of sins, just like I've yeah. proven there. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. So this is my old AGV helmet. It's carbon fiber. I've had this, well, I think it's, it's manufactured 2015, so it's seven years old. I've taken this on bike launches. I've been around the Pyrenees with this. This was my sort of primary helmet for the last probably three or four years. I, I don't remember ever dropping it. I don't remember, you know, I've always looked after it. It has been shipped on airplanes for launches and stuff like that. It'd be interesting now to, to test it 
and see what we find with this helmet. It's been painted in a bit of white. What was it, John? Was it what sub? Was it just like it's just a, it's just a, a very passive coating? A passive coating. It washes off basically, but it has yeah, to be white off, yeah. to, to be able to do the testing. This is why it's all white basically. So um, this will be interesting to see how this one tests and what what we can see with the history of this helmet. What I'm now going to do is simply uh, put some heat onto that. We're just generally warming that up. Cooling duct here, yeah. cooling duct there, but this region there's here some, there's, is, some, there's something going on with these. Yeah, they're dark just they're, they're here. just um, bumps that shouldn't be there. Okay. Yeah, yeah think I, I think that's been clonked really? and possibly a couple of times. So we tested my AGV helmet. Unfortunately, it's quite badly damaged. I really wanted to go with a helmet which is undamaged to drop it to, to, to create a, an impact you'd get, you know, from your helmet falling off your bike to see if that would is enough of a fall to, to seriously damage your, your helmet to compromise it. Unfortunately, my AGV was seriously damaged on the on the top piece and also one of the sides was seriously damaged as well so we couldn't it was, it was pointless doing that testing and i wasn't not you know i didn't have any other helmets i wanted to wreck as part of these tests but it goes to show that helmet looked perfect but it was showing damage i mean it's possible that that is even manufacturing damage you know where that the carbon hasn't been laid up properly and it's not working as it should be it's possible um, because I couldn't see any external damage on that helmet at all, but uh, it's very interesting. Obviously, what, what you do see a lot of blobs and, and stuff on that screen, you have to understand how the helmet is made up. Obviously, on that AGV, there was lots of vents, so you know there's, there's grooves in the carbon where vent systems are. So as part of the analysis these guys do, it's not just John doing this, he's got a team of 10 people work there. They look at the helmet and see you know, there's a vent going from here to here. So as a result, you, know, you take that into consideration where the structural design of the helmets, or, or there's stickers on, or there's features on it, which could potentially interfere with the results. So you have to really look at the helmet and, and work out what's going on with its structure and then where the damage areas could be. But uh, back to the video. So in terms of looking at the surface finish, there's absolutely nothing that would give it away yeah. that would give you any information about those um, uh, strain risers that we saw. But whether or not this uh, edge effect here has led to weakness. I don't know. Like a potential manufacturing defect, yeah, yeah. You mean, potentially. Yeah, or a weakness, but I don't know. Um, and the conventional testing that is is done, the you know the British standards testing, or the 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 same with the EU is where they look at for an impact yeah. tester and in so doing what you're really looking at is can the shell withstand some sort of vertical spike or horizontal you know etc well, that's fine but really what i'm interested in is what happens when it you know when i buy heads in it and i, I can pretty well dodge flying spikes and <laughs> waiting for the first one but um this area here is a very typical area that if you come off the back, yeah, you're gonna hit. You, that's where you're going to hit. And also tops, and, and the reason we look at sides is because that's what happens when you come off. Where, where are you going to be smacking your head? It's, it's, it's usually front on, back on, or side on. We were going to drop that helmet, <laughs> damage it, and then it's already completely damaged. So uh, there's no way I'm dropping the, the shoe, that's my new one. So we didn't do the drop test, but it, we got a very good example of showing you what, what damage actually looks like on the helmet. And that is quite incredible because I probably still would have not known and maybe even ridden with that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't. There's absolutely, you look at, you give that helmet a visual inspection. There's nothing wrong with it, is and there? And you cannot see anything yeah. wrong with that at all. Yeah. So, and I, yeah. I think that's been damaged when it's about three times that's been flown. So I've got like a big kit bag and there's a helmet compartment at the end and the, you know, the helmet's in its own bag, but there's no protection, you know, it's not in like it comes shipped in the box where you've got yeah. all the cellophane and all the yeah. polystyrene in there. And I think that's been thrown about in yeah. the haulage by the haulage guys, you know, stuff thrown on top of it. And that's why I think that damage has happened. You, you can only speculate really, can't well, you? you can, I mean, yeah. You know, it's, uh, you, you know, as the owner of that helmet that you've not dropped it or you've not yeah. misused it in any way, shape or form that would cause that. So something has caused that damage yeah. to happen yeah. to your helmet. Yeah. But so. no, really fascinating. 
So there we are, what do you make of that? Now, the reason I went along to the helmet inspection company is I was contacted by Martin and said, you know, we're, we're offering this service to customers. Do you think it's something your subscribers would be interested in? And I was like, yes. I mean, this isn't a paid advert for the helmet inspection company. You know, I use my own diesel to get there. I've been paid no money. I just thought this was really interesting because I've dropped helmets in the past before and you think, oh no, is that rude? And I just thought this would be a really good service and something I thought I'd let you guys know about. So after we scanned the AGV, by the way, I dropped the, the start of this video, I dropped the AVG. That was after all this testing happened. So I knew it was already duff. So I didn't pick up the, the damage from when I dropped it as part of this video. But I did get them also to scan my uh, X-Spirit. And I'm pleased to say this one is perfect. There's nothing wrong with my X-Spirit, which is great. An observation I made, like on this helmet when we scanned it, things like these decals on the shoey are actually underneath the clear coat. And some of these sort of show up as part of the scanning process. So uh, the only other thing I would say, you know, is the more complex your helmet, you know, with plastic spoilers and stuff on, it does make it harder for those guys to determine where the damage is. So if you've got a very basic old fashioned helmet, let's say, like that bell they had at the start of the video, which they demonstrated on, it's quite easy to spot the damage, but the more complex the helmets, of decals and all that sort of thing, the harder it is to spot the damage. And it took a little while to sort of scan this one and ascertain, you know, this was part of plastic structure. This was caused by, you know, the stickers being underneath the gel coat, things like that. So it's a fantastic service, fantastic technology, but the more complex the helmet, the more difficult it is to actually read it, if you like. But those guys are really skilled. John's been doing it for, well, I don't know how many years he's been doing it for, but all of his, about 10 people there, all fully qualified. They all do the life, lifeboat scanning, but it's almost like when you go and you have a baby and they do like the ultrasound scan of, of, your, of, of the womb, you know. You, to the untrained eye, you haven't got a clue what's going on. It's just blobs and, you know, it's just a mess, but you've got to be trained to interpret that mess to actually see what you're looking at. Now, if you're interested in the service, it's 40 quid to get your helmet inspected. You basically post it to them. Um, every stage of the process, they run a barcode, you know, they scan your barcode, you get an email telling you, you know, your helmet's arrived, your helmet's been through the process, your helmet's passed, your helmet's failed, or your helmet's been waiting to be collected by the courier to be sent back to you. So it's all a mail order type service. You have to package your helmet up yourself and send it to them, but they actually insure that for £5,000. So as part of this process, you can send it to them as cheap as you like. You know, you can send it to them with Hermes for a couple of quid and they are insure that for £5,000 at their end. And then as part of that 40 quid, they then send that back to you, again, all insured. Turnaround's about between one to three days is what Martin told me. So, so there you go. I found this absolutely fascinating. So if you've got a helmet you've dropped, you're a bit unsure about, or like me, you've got a helmet you've been using for a, th a few years and you just like to get it checked for a bit of peace, um, peace of mind, have a look at the link below. It's the Helmet Inspection Company. I'll put a link in the description and on the bottom of the screen up to their website. Have a look round it. But I just thought I'd let you know what this is all about. And uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. So there we go, guys. That's all from me. Get on with your day. See you later on.